3,000 years ago, the spot where I'm sat now was the highest point in an enclosed settlement home to a small number of households who occupied this hill in the Late Bronze Age and the Iron Age. Then, in the Roman, Romano-British and Anglo-Saxon periods, the archaeology of this hillside goes largely silent. However, in the early 13th century, people returned to this hill in large numbers and built, well, this. There are many reasons why people might choose to come to a hill like this. For some, it might be defence. For others, it might be as a statement of power, prestige and control of the surrounding land. And the Bronze Age, the Iron Age and the Medieval period weren't the only times this hill was occupied. Artifacts have been found on this hillside which date to the Mesolithic, some 10,000 years ago. They were flint tools and would have belonged to hunters who came up here probably to track large mammals across the plain below. Much more recently in the last few centuries, this hill has become a tourist attraction and amongst the people who came here was J.M.W. Turner who came to paint the scenic landscapes. Therefore, although separated by 10 millennia, people have come to this hill time and again for its view. And this hill isn't alone. Let's jump 10 miles that way. Here on Hellsby Hill, evidence of burning and woodland clearance suggests it may have hosted domestic or ceremonial activity from the very start of the Neolithic, some 6,000 years ago. Then, like Beeston, it was occupied in the Bronze Age and the Iron Age, and here there is also a little evidence of some post-Roman or Romano-British activity. In the Second World War, both the Royal Observer Corps and the Home Guard established a post on this hill, and more recently still, a Cold War observation bunker was built underneath where I am standing now and hinted at by a green shaft in the next field to watch over the port and city of Liverpool. Therefore, people have come to this hill as well for its view. These sites aren't alone. They are both prominent hills in the wider landscape of the Mid-Cheshire Ridge, a sandstone upland rising out of the Cheshire Plains stretching from around the town of Malpas in the south up to the Mersey estuary at Helsby and Frodsham in the north. There's at least one medieval royal hunting forest, four castles, nine prehistoric forts, 41 scheduled monuments and 449 listed buildings amongst the archaeology of this landscape. They, and other sites from early caves to post-medieval promenades, prompt this work. But what is this work? So, I'm Andrew, and I've just finished the first year of my undergraduate degree in archaeology at the University of York. This summer, I've been offered the opportunity to conduct extracurricular archaeological research, and that's why I'm speaking to you now. I hope to showcase the sort of interesting and exciting research undergraduates in archaeology can undertake. My interest is in the views from archaeological landscapes. One of the most basic things we can study is to assess what people could see and describe the views from their sites. It may sound obvious enough, but studying views from past sites can tell us a lot about the experiences of perceptions of people who lived in the past. For example, under my feet now is a Bronze Age bronze makers workshop and the settlement is spread out around me. Now, the excavation report from the 1990s gives the impression of this site as a production centre, a defended place for workers, and a place where domestic activities occurred alongside. That's reasonable enough, but it's quite a limited economic and mechanical account of life here. With prehistory, we can face difficulties characterising what daily life was like. But by studying view, I say we can make some fairly confident claims about everyday perceptions and experiences. These people lived in a very prominent position. They woke each morning to look out over 25 miles or more towards the sunrise over the Peak District and what are now the Staffordshire Moors. They looked out over a low inland plain which was probably heavily forested and sparsely populated. The fires from the Bronze Forge must have shone out, especially if lit at night. Imagine watching it flickering on the hillside from the plain below. Or imagine being in charge of that fire and projecting it into the landscape. To put it another way, 
Imagine what a premium a view like this would add on to a modern house price. That might give some idea why this view might have mattered to our Bronze Age inhabitants as well. We can go further than just description, however. If we can reduce the view into data, then we can start to compare between sites. How much can be seen, how far, and in what directions. We can then begin to question why people might have preferred one site to another, and, while remembering that other factors would be in play too, question whether the choice of view affected the settlement location. We can also compare the view between different periods of time. Are there patterns in different periods of time? Did people have preferences for different views in different periods? How can we, that is, how will I, go about researching this? Well, there are three main methods. Firstly, I'll be in the library, in spirit if not in person, depending on restrictions at the time, researching the sites and interpretations about the landscape. Such desk-based research is a crucial part of many archaeological projects. My resources will extend beyond text, however, because I'll be using old maps, LIDAR data and geophysics data as well. Secondly, I'll be researching the landscape on foot, noting sites, prominent hilltops and qualities of the view. And thirdly, I will compile and assess the information in a geographic information system on a computer. I'll run what we call a view shed analysis, which assesses the view on a digital map called a digital elevation model. I will then assess that data with statistics and apply my own interpretations with a view to answering the questions of describing the view that they experienced and comparing between different sites and different time periods. GIS viewshed analysis first became prominent in the 1990s and early 2000s when computers were powerful enough to produce meaningful data. As you might imagine, in the time since, it has drawn more than a few critical comments, as archaeological theory broadens from what we would call a scientific, positivist approach. However, I don't believe these problems are insurmountable, and indeed a more theoretically aware approach can have a lot to contribute. Let's take a few examples. For one, Viewshed only models topography, the shape of the land, so it doesn't take into account other obstacles to view, like vegetation or buildings, or atmospheric conditions. To this, we can say that Viewshed tells us what is potentially visible and also what is definitely not visible because it is obscured by the land. I believe we can also address this issue practically by assessing the view on the ground. We can then see how the view is being conserved, or not, as part of the modern heritage experience which we can compare to the data model. This is Woodhouse Hill Fort, for example which is fairly archaeologically elusive, but would have had striking views of the Mersey estuary. However, today, those views are obscured by modern vegetation, although they may be somewhat more visible in the winter. We can also consider modern issues like access. Here, at Eddisbury Hillfort, only a small part of the rampart is accessible from the public footpath. The rest is private farmland. While there are very expansive views available, the limited access skews our perception of what views from this site would have been like. Another risk with my analysis is tautology, a closed circle of reasoning. If I were considering why people settled on hilltops and then only studied hilltop sites, I'd be deciding my own conclusion by not considering alternatives. The solution to this is a variant on what's called the Monte Carlo simulation, which unfortunately doesn't involve bringing any Mediterranean grammar to this landscape but does involve establishing a large number of random points in the landscape and sampling their viewsheds too. Another issue is the observer's height. Viewshed algorithms ask you to input an observer height, which is the height the landscape is seen from. Traditionally, 1.7 metres has been assumed, but that assumption is questionable. At 186 centimetres tall, my eye level is about 173 centimetres, so it's ever so slightly too low for me. And, of course, height was different in the past. The average medieval male buried at Norton Priory, just to the north, was 172 centimetres, so had an eye level of about 160 centimetres. And the past is at least 50% female, so if we look at a more balanced cemetery like medieval Poulton to the west, 
the average female height was 160 centimetres, meaning an eyeline of about 149 centimetres, while the average male height was 170 centimetres for an 158 centimetre eyeline. Add in children, people with disabilities and conditions, and other periods like the Iron Age, then we see that observer height is no matter for assumption and actually a meaningful decision. By approximating from osteological data, we can at least come closer to a representative estimate. So, there are reasons to be cautious with a project like this, which hopefully I've tackled. But why study it? Why study it now? I've already discussed the archaeological importance of studying decision-making, experience and perception. But the importance extends beyond archaeology. Heritage is often considered at the level of building or site, but this project looks at the wider landscape to see how the view is being conserved or lost in the present day. Secondly, this landscape has just been shortlisted for Area of Outstanding Natural Beauty status one of four places in the UK to achieve that shortlisting. Studying the view feeds into securing that status and therefore working to conserve the area. And finally, this and similar landscapes have grown in popularity during the current pandemic as more and more people turn to exploring local areas. The interpretations offered by this research and the opportunities for engagement it presents help to support the area's environment and archaeology. So, that is what I plan to do, how and why. As for the results in the interpretations, well, they're yet to come. In the meantime, if you get the opportunity to visit a site of archaeology or heritage, I encourage you to stop for a moment and consider the view. What might it have meant for the people who once lived there? Thanks for watching.